Some of these phishing emails are so dumb. It's like, we have determined that somebody might have your credit card. Can you please enter it now and send it back to us? All right, everyone, looks like we can go ahead and get started. My name is Kirk Sigmund, I'm the president of the Cornell Federal Society, and we are very proud to present our very last event of this semester with Mr. Alan Gura. As we've explained through many of our emails, Mr. Gura is the man behind a lot of the Second Amendment litigation of the 21st century. He is the man behind McDonald v. Chicago, as well as uh, DC v. Heller. We are very proud to have him. Uh, we, he's actually a Cornell alum, so we're kind of proud to have him in that sense as well. Uh, with no further ado, Mr. Alan Gura. Thanks. Let's go red. All right. Well, thank you all for, uh, for coming out here tonight. Um, I'm not sure if you've covered uh, Heller or McDonald yet in your Con Law 2 classes, if, uh, if you've gone around with that material. Um, but we're going to cover them, or at least where they're going, and uh, what we can expect to see in the future from courts as they delve into the second and field. My talk today is not meant to be predictive. I'm not going to tell you how this is all going to spin out. It's always important to remember that there's nobody in America who is fully satisfied with every First Amendment decision the Supreme Court has cooked up, every Fourth Amendment decision, so it's unrealistic, regardless of your views on the Second Amendment or the issue of gun control, that as this unfolds in the coming years, that uh, any of you will be uh, fully satisfied customers. However, uh, if uh, Heller and McDonald are adhered to and the court continues on the same path that we've seen, the guidance from those cases suggests that at least uh, our side, the pro-Second uh, Amendment rights side, will have more to be uh, happy about than the uh, more uh, restrictive side that's always calling for reduced uh, rights to keep and bear arms. Uh, Heller and, and McDonald have been criticized by many lawyers and some judges for allegedly being uh, vague and for not giving us enough guidance beyond telling us that, yes, there is a fundamental right to keep and bear arms. I think those critiques are uh, incorrect. And if we read Heller and if we read McDonald, there's actually quite a, a fair amount of guidance that tells us what we can expect, uh, again, if those cases uh, are adhered to. So let's go down uh, the various uh, types of gun laws that are being challenged right now uh, throughout the country, state and federal courts, and uh, civil and criminal cases. And uh, let's see how uh, these types of laws might be analyzed or how they would fare uh, under the uh, black and white text that is currently uh, printed in the Supreme Court reports. The first kind of gun law that still exists in America in some places is the type of law that can be said to merely conflict with some core guarantee of the Second Amendment by itself. Imagine in the First Amendment context if there was a law that said, you know, thou shalt not speak or you cannot worship. Uh, or if there were a law that said that the, uh, everyone had to give the police chief a, a key to the front door, obviously uh, it would not take a whole lot of thought and analysis by any court to say that there's a problem with such a law, that it simply conflicts with some basic guarantee of the relevant constitutional provision and it cannot survive. Heller demonstrated uh, one such law. Uh, Washington, D.C., of course, had this, what we call the functional firearms ban. Washington allowed you to have uh, certain guns in the house, rifles, shotguns that were uh, properly registered if everybody wanted to go through that process. And at the end of the day, people were allowed to keep non-functional weapons only. That is, uh, the moment that you rendered your firearm uh, operational and functional, uh, you were committing a crime. Uh, so if the bad guy came through your uh, window and you had a shotgun, you could whack him over the head with it, you could throw it at them, but you better not uh, take off a lock and put a shell in the firearm. Uh, we reasoned, and the courts agreed with us, both the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court, that if there's a right to keep and bear arms, you have the right to keep and bear functional arms that actually work, uh, right? I mean, why would you want to have a non-working firearm unless, I guess, you're just a collector? Um, and uh, having found that a primary purpose, not the only purpose, but a main purpose of securing the Second Amendment is, the, uh, is advancing the individual right to self-defense, uh, prohibiting people from using arms for that purpose simply violated uh, the Second Amendment at its core and that law was struck down without any balancing test, without any standard of review, without any of these uh, means and uh, scrutinies that we uh, learn about in, in Con Law 2 here in law school. And uh, uh, again, this is not, as some people would say, uh, a bug, it is a feature. The fact that Heller was able to decide this without 
uh, announcing a standard review tells us that some laws aren't going to need that. Do we have such laws still in place? Yes, we do. Uh, there are some laws that forbid uh, outright all carrying of, of guns, without exception, without any available license. Uh, Illinois still has such a law. Washington, D.C. Has such, still has such a law. Um, and in a moment, I'll get to the issue of carrying in public. But uh, clearly, forbidden it completely simply conflicts with, with the core guarantee. Uh, we had a law uh, lately in the city of Chicago, uh, Chicago post McDonald banned uh, people from operating or accessing gun ranges throughout the city. Uh, I sued them on behalf of uh, some residents in Chicago and the Second Amendment Foundation. And we reasoned uh, that uh, if you have the right to keep and bear arms, you have the right to practice with those firearms. What else would you do with a gun uh, if you would not once in a while at least go to a range and, and practice with it? Um, uh, the city, in fact, understood that there was value in training and proficiency. They mandated it as a condition of having a firearm in Chicago. Then they banned the training that they required. So uh, that was another issue we had. Can you require something as a condition of gun ownership and then burden gun ownership by prohibiting that which you require? But our first argument was, look, this is a core aspect of the right to keep your arms, the right to go somewhere and practice the use of those arms. Even if the only use in the world you have for a firearm is to keep it around in case of an emergency, uh, still, uh, most people would agree that you should, uh, from time to time, go out and get some training and get some practice so that you are uh, not a danger to yourself or innocent people and that you might actually be able to effectively use the gun uh, in a time of, of need. So the Seventh Circuit um, agreed with us. Uh, the, uh, the court ordered that a preliminary injunction would be issued against the complete ban on gun ranges. We're still litigating the new regulations that, that came afterwards. But uh, if you read that opinion carefully, you will see references uh, to this right to, to practice and trade with firearms again. Prohibiting that outright is, is going to conflict with the Second Amendment. The next kind of law that um, we're going to see litigated, in fact, we do see litigated in many places, is a categorical law that bans or restricts access to certain types of arms. We know from Heller that all firearms are arms. However, uh, uh, please take note that uh, arms, as used in the Second Amendment, does not merely encompass firearms. It also refers to certain other things. Uh, state high courts using analogous uh, constitutional provisions and state constitutions have had a wealth of experience dealing with clubs, knives, uh, other kinds of tools. There's a case now in the Second Circuit. Uh, this is the case that uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, got in trouble with a little bit uh, during her confirmation of a case dealing with, uh, with nunchucks, martial arts weapons. Uh, in the 1970s, after the Bruce Lee movies were popular, uh, some legislators reacted uh, by banning martial arts weapons, because there was a fear, I guess, that ninjas would take over America and, and uh, you know, whack everybody with, with little uh, uh, nunchucks. Uh, there's a, a fellow by the name of James Maloney, I believe, is an admiralty lawyer in New York who's an aficionado of these things, and he's filed a Second Amendment lawsuit, which, is, I guess, has now been remanded in the wake of McDonald. So we wait to see the outcome of that. Uh, but Heller told us, at least, what the principles here were going to be. Uh, Heller told us that uh, in the context of our challenge to DC's handgun ban, which was of course a law that categorically banned a certain type of arm, the court would look to whether or not people had uh, an expectation that these arms would be of the kind uh, in common use uh, today for traditional lawful purposes. Uh, even though guns, handguns have been illegal in Washington DC for over 30 years, nonetheless the court could look to the American experience and say, look, this is the type of firearm that Americans prefer to have available to them. They do have lawful traditional applications, and therefore, whatever else you do to regulate handguns, you can't ban them entirely. Of course, the court uh, noted that handguns uh, are used in crime quite frequently. If you're going to rob a bank or a 7-Eleven, you're probably going to use a handgun. You're not going to use a long black military-style rifle. I'm not telling you how to rob the bank or the 7-Eleven. It's not the purpose of my talk today. But of course, it, it, it's obvious that handguns are used in crime. Criminals like them, but so do law-abiding people. And so uh, they are protected. Uh, the potential for criminal misuse is quite irrelevant. The test is whether or not this is an arm of the kind that people would expect to have 
in common use for a traditional and lawful purpose. And one of the um, uh, problems that people sometimes have with this uh, so-called common use test is what, I get this question all the time, and it's a critique that's, that's, that occurs quite frequently, which is, um, is there a circularity problem? What if something were invented uh, and the government were to immediately restrict it or ban it, therefore it does not attain a popularity or widespread usage, can the government then bootstrap that circumstance and turn around and say, aha, this is not in common use, therefore it's not protected because we banned it or restricted it. And the answer there is no. Again, the DC example, handguns, uh, only in common use for non-lawful purposes at the time of the lawsuit, but the court could look to a background expectation uh, under our traditional right to arms as it's been understood in this country. I would analogize this to the Fourth Amendment uh, test that we see uh, oftentimes where the touchstone of, of a Fourth Amendment question is whether an individual making the claim has a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the reasonableness of that expectation is, um, is measured not purely in a subjective sense. Uh, it, it's measured according to American tradition and experience. If you lived in an Orwellian surveillance state and uh, you know, John Ashcroft and George Bush were listening to all your phone calls and reading all your emails, you, know, you might still have some Fourth Amendment rights, maybe they're violated, but the court would not say, look, you, know, you should know that you're being listened to and therefore you have no expectation of privacy. That's not the way the Fourth Amendment works. In fact, it didn't work um, in 1968 when the court overruled its decision in Olmstead. Uh, people here who've taken Collins, you might recall, in the 1920s, the Supreme Court held that you didn't have a Fourth Amendment right to privacy in your phone calls. Uh, the government could tap your phone. Forty years later, they changed uh, the, their mind. The Fourth Amendment now uh, is understood to have that uh, kind of protection. And the answer in that case was not to tell the defendant that he should have gone to law school and read Olmstead. He would have known he had no expectation of privacy. So I don't think there's a circularity issue with the common use test. But let's see how that common use test might be applied in some uh, future cases. Um, we have uh, some laws right now. Uh, I'm challenging a law in California that's in the nature of uh, these handgun roster laws. That is, the state decides that uh, all handguns are illegal unless they appear on our special list of handguns that are determined to be not safe. And then uh, what they do with that is, even though it started out as a testing mechanism to make sure that you know, guns were they were going to the marketplace uh, were, were uh, safe, that is, they could pass a drop test, they wouldn't malfunction and blow up in someone's hands. It later became uh, uh, something very different. The legislature decided that uh, California being a very large market for firearms, if only they would dictate the features that handguns were to have, they would then alter the marketplace and change the kinds of handguns that people would have access to in the United States, and everything else would be forbidden. Uh, that is diametrically opposed to the idea that the Second Amendment protects handguns of the kind in common use. Uh, we don't let legislatures determine what is optimally the best design and then uh, prescribe that for people. This is a fundamental right. People do have some freedom of choice. Likewise, the so-called assault weapons bans um, that seek to prohibit rifles based upon their aesthetic characteristics for the most part. Again, we're not talking about military weapons, we're talking about civilian versions of military weapons, weapons that look like scary, uh, evil black rifles, but in fact are merely semi-automatic rifles that have a uh, very popular application in the shooting sports, and very valid self-defense uses. I don't think you can ban them just because some people uh, object to their uh, lineage. Uh, so again, those laws uh, you know, should be in trouble. We've seen a number of opinions uh, uh, come out and were about to come out in that area. Um, in uh, D.C., in the D.C. Circuit, a case called Heller II involving my former client, Dick Heller. I had nothing to do with the case. I was not involved in the case in any manner. But uh, Mr. Heller teamed up with uh, other people and challenged Washington, D.C.'s ban on so-called assault weapons in addition to a whole host of other challenges raised in that case, perhaps too many challenges, and I can address that later. But uh, nonetheless, the D.C. Circuit uh, upheld uh, the uh, D.C. assault weapons law, uh, erroneously in my view, by uh, first seeming to acknowledge that these are arms of the kind of common use, but then applying uh, a balancing test 
uh, saying, well, you know, it's not that bad of an infringement on Second Amendment rights. You can have access to other guns. That is uh, completely um, uh, at odds with, with, uh, with Parker and later with Heller. And we'll see how that uh, shakes up later. Meanwhile, in the state of Illinois, the Illinois Supreme Court is currently considering a case called uh, Cook versus, uh, no, Wilson versus Cook County, a uh, challenge to uh, Illinois' adoption of the same law. And uh, we're still waiting uh, argument and decision in that. Um, uh, I encourage everyone to pay attention. That's a very interesting case, and it could lead to, again, uh, more uh, input on this question uh, from the courts. The third kind of law uh, that is being litigated right now, I'm litigating it, other people are litigating it, and I believe it reaches probably the next big area the Supreme Court will enter into uh, with respect to the Second Amendment, is the, uh, the question of what do we do about carrying handguns in public? Uh, most states uh, allow the practice, either without any kind of restriction, or more commonly, they license it, and you need to meet certain basic qualifications to obtain a license, usually a criminal background check, uh, demonstrated proficiency, perhaps a class on your state's use of force laws. Uh, but at the end of the day, unless there's some reason to prohibit the, the applicant from having uh, the permit, the permit is issued. Now, there are other restrictions that go along with the permit. The state, of course, can still uh, tell you not to take your fire to certain kinds of places or under certain circumstances. But generally speaking, the license is available. There are only a small handful of states, and it is at this point a handful, that uh, leave the issuance of the license to the discretion of some authority, usually the county sheriff or a judge or some other kind of licensing official who makes a determination whether the applicant, uh, having passed the criminal background check and all the other uh, training and educational requirements, the authority then asks whether the person is of good moral character and or has proper cause to want to carry a gun for self-defense. Um, this type of law is doomed, in my opinion, if it gets to the Supreme Court, and I predict that it will, for the very simple reason that it violates the very long established principles of prior restraint. Um, uh, <clears throat> it is truly well established for decades that when you have a right secured by the Constitution. Uh, the government can license uh, your enjoyment of that right, but when it does so, it has to use objective factors. There have to be uh, objective qualifications. There's no room for a licensing official's unbridled discretion. After all, if engaging in some kind of activity is a right that you enjoy, then you don't have to prove that you deserve to have something that is your right. Uh, you might have to meet certain uh, uh, qualifications, perhaps, to show that, you know, yes, I can carry a gun because I, you know, I can see, you know, I'm not sure that they would license, you know, blind people, perhaps, uh, to, uh, to carry firearms for self-defense. But uh, at some point, the license has to be issued. So if there is a right to carry a firearm, and there is, in fact, uh, as we'll describe in a minute, uh, the license to have that, whatever other conditions might be imposed, the idea that it's up to somebody's whim or idea of your, uh, of your morality or your proper cause to enjoy your rights uh, is not going to survive. Again, prior restraint doctrine is very well developed. So is there uh, this right to, to, to bear arms? Does that mean bearing arms outside the home? Why, yes it does, and here Heller and McDonald give a lot of guidance. Uh, the other side is truly in denial about this, uh, as are some judges, regrettably. But the text of the Supreme Court's opinions is very clear and unshakable. First of all, uh, the uh, court told us that the Second Amendment, like other parts of the Constitution, are interpreted according to their original public meaning. What did these words mean to the people who ratified them uh, into law? After all, the Constitution has to have some fixed meaning. If it doesn't mean anything, then why have it, right? I mean, it, if it's just some words that we pour into our own favorite policies, then, then constitutional law really is, is, uh, is, is a silly exercise. But these words have meaning. They have the meaning that the people in common uh, society would ascribe to them. And the Supreme Court held that uh, then as now, uh, to bear means to carry. And the Supreme Court went further and told us that to bear arms, as used in the Second Amendment, means 
uh, to have on your person or in your clothing or in your pocket uh, a firearm for purposes of being armed and ready for confrontation uh, in case of a confrontation with, with another person. Um, why did the Supreme Court need to, uh, to tell us all this in, in Heller? After all, Mr. Heller only applied for a license to carry a gun inside his home. Very strange law in D.C. Uh, D.C. required, actually, the only place that we've seen, uh, a, a license not just uh, to, uh, to carry a gun in public, but also one to carry a gun, say, from your living room to your dining room to your kitchen. And of course, those licenses were, were unavailable. And so uh, uh, that's the kind of license that Mr. Heller wanted, the Supreme Court held that he was entitled to have one. But, but there was no question in, in Heller about public carrying. It wasn't specifically litigated. So why was this reached? Well, it was reached because the city litigated their case that way. Uh, the city, of course, had a defense uh, in Heller. They argued that to bear arms as used in the Second Amendment has a militaristic idiomatic meaning, that it means to soldier, to go off into battle. If you're bearing arms, it must mean that you're engaging in some kind of military duty on behalf of the state. And this informs our understanding of the nature of, of the Second Amendment right. The Supreme Court had to address the meaning of bear arms in order to resolve the case. And it did so. Having done so, that's not dicta. That was necessary to reach the decision in the case. Uh, and even if it were dicta, uh, woe be unto the lawyer or, or, or to the lower court that says, well, the Supreme Court understood this language means one thing, but we think it means something else. Uh, that I have yet to see. I've seen decisions that say we don't want to reach the question. I've seen decisions that say we're, uh, we refuse to reach the question because we, don't, we just aren't going to, or, or decisions that, that, that uh, argue that uh, because the facts of Heller were within a home context, the holding is therefore limited to the home, which is, is, is most law students would know a silly argument, really. Uh, the reason we have opinions is because the reasoning of the opinions is supposed to instruct future courts as to how to uh, decide future cases, right? Uh, courts don't simply uh, give us the result, and then the result is the only holding, and the other 66 pages of Heller are, are meaningless and, and just written for fun. Uh, no, that's not the way the law works. And so I, I don't think that's a, that's, a, that's a serious argument. I've even seen one court that said, yes, in Heller, the Supreme Court said bear arms means to carry them. But that was only an answer to that question. And if you ask a different question, perhaps the meaning of the text is going to be different too, which is, uh, you know, recalls uh, Humpty Dumpty from uh, Through the Looking Glass. You know, when I use a word, it means what I think it means. Uh, I don't think that that's going to have a future at the Supreme Court. But never have I seen an opinion that says, um, or even a brief from the lawyers on the side that says, no, to bear arms means X, X being something other than what the Supreme Court in Heller told us it means. Now, beyond defining bearing arms, the Supreme Court provided a host of exceptions that prove the rule. We were told that you cannot, you do not have the right to carry any kind of arm, any place, any time, for any purpose. Well, that must mean that you have the right to carry some types of arms, some places, for some purposes, right? And of course, we were, we were told um, that uh, presumptively lawful laws include those that restrict the carrying of arms into so-called sensitive places. Now, we don't know what a sensitive place is or isn't. We can imagine what some examples of what a sensitive place might be. Um, the court didn't tell us how to, how to resolve that question, and future cases probably will, will go down that path. But the first thing we know is that if you're not supposed to take a gun to a sensitive place, that must mean you have a right to take a gun into non-sensitive places, right? Uh, and then the court went on to explore uh, older precedents that dealt with the carrying of concealed weapons. Uh, the court cited no fewer than four uh, state Supreme Court cases uh, dealt, dealing with uh, the Second Amendment or state analogs, uh, mostly decided, I guess, in the 19th century, that dealt with prohibitions on the concealed carrying of arms. And what jumps out from all these cases is a conditional rule. And the rule goes something like this. You can ban the concealed carrying of guns, because when you ban the concealed carrying of guns, you are banning simply the manner in which guns are carried. You're regulating the manner in which arms are carried. This is a manner of carrying arms that we don't like in 19th century America. It's viewed with suspicion. People who hide their firearms uh, perhaps want uh, the advantage of unfair surprise over their rivals, 
virtuous people exercising the right to uh, carry their arms openly. Today we have a very different uh, view in most places. Uh, states are quite comfortable licensing the concealed carrying of arms. However, even in many of these states where one would think they're, they're, they're very pro-gun, uh, you can't run for statewide office without being uh, perceived as a friend of the Second Amendment, uh, those states uh, will often prohibit uh, the open carrying of firearms. I'm talking about places like Texas, Oklahoma, Florida. Uh, so um, the, the rule works both ways. The state has the ability to regulate the manner in which you carry guns. It can tell you that concealed carrying, sneaky, we don't want that, prohibit that. It can also say open carrying is, is, is uh, uh, scary to people who are familiar with firearms and accustomed to seeing them. Today that's probably the rule in many places. If you walk around with guns openly in many parts of America, I think you're going to get a second and third look. Um, but whatever decision the legislature makes, it can't ban all carrying of firearms, and, and the cases uh, dealing with concealed carry prohibitions make that explicitly clear, and Heller even quotes some of those. So the fact that, uh, yes, traditionally concealed carrying has been banned, doesn't mean that it can be banned today unless states would allow the open carrying of guns, and I think many of the places um, that would like to get rid of uh, all, gun law, all guns, uh, probably if they're forced to make a choice, they would probably choose the concealed rather than the open carrying of firearms. Uh, What's left? We've gone through laws that conflict with the core of the right, laws that deal with categorical restrictions, banning certain types of arms, uh, licensing uh, issues, uh, prior strains, the carrying of guns. We get then to the what I would call the catch-all category, the everything else category, and this is where we do need perhaps some means and level of scrutiny. Uh, this is what law professors have sometimes refer to as the construction zone. You need to actually engage in construction. Interpreting the Constitution uh, is not going to uh, resolve the case. Uh, and this should be a last resort for litigators and courts. Uh, if you have some more specific way of resolving the case, that's the way it should be resolved. If not, then you can go to one of these levels of scrutiny. And then what do we have on the table? Well, uh, Heller made very clear, and everybody understands this part of it at least, the rational basis is off the table. Uh, this is a fundamental right. Rational basis review is not appropriate. It's not going to be there. Uh, the Brady Center has a brief they like to file in every case that tries to argue for rational basis. They have a different word for it. They call it reasonable review. If it's reasonable, it's OK, right? And, and, and uh, they said, well, it's not rational basis. It's reasonable. And, and courts have just rejected that outright. Uh, uh, even Heller, too, said, no, that's rational basis. You can't do that. Uh, oftentimes, courts won't even address it. Instead, what courts are doing is they're, we're seeing in, in, in circuit after circuit after circuit is we're coming down to the following paradigm. It works like this. Uh, courts will say uh, a lot of references to the First Amendment in, in Heller, uh, they are kind of similar, the First and Second Amendment. They both sort of deal with uh, the things that you can do, the sphere of activity that's privileged perhaps against government intrusion. And, so, and, and also, judges love this. We have a lot of law in the First Amendment, right? I mean, we don't have to invent stuff. We, we, the First Amendment is something that's actually been litigated now for many decades, and there's some kind of understanding as to how it works. So you give, it, you give a court an option to go to the familiar thing that kind of looks right, they'll, they usually do it. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's even correct. And so what they'll say is it's like the First Amendment. It depends on the nature of, of the claim. Uh, if you have a, uh, a claim by law-abiding, responsible people that goes to the core of, of the right, we use strict scrutiny. If you have uh, a claim that's more peripheral, uh, a claim by people who are um, not so trustworthy, people who uh, you know, have done bad things, uh, whose who's, uh, standing to uh, assert a Second Amendment right might be at the, the periphery of the right as it's been historically understood, you go to a lower level review, intermediate scrutiny has been the one that they've used, which is still a form of heightened scrutiny. It's still a form that places the burden on the government to prove its case, uh, and, uh, and uh, post hoc rationalizations don't cut it. Um, so um, uh, that's pretty much the lay of the land. Uh, most of the uh, cases we've seen to date at the appellate level, not surprisingly, have been the criminal cases. Those go first in our system. 
People have speedy trial rights, of course, place a priority on those, and those are always in the pipeline. It takes time for people like me to set up a civil case and sludge it through the courts. Uh, it doesn't take any time for somebody to do something illegal and get arrested and prosecuted. So uh, we've seen a number of Second Amendment challenges to things like felon in possession, the uh, domestic violence misdemeanor ban, things like that. And you know, usually the courts dealing with criminals will say, look, you're not a law-abiding responsible people, intermediate scrutiny for you. Even in that case, courts have sometimes told the government to do their homework again, come back with a greater justification for a law that really nobody thinks is going to be struck down, at least not on its face across the board in all of its applications. But in all those cases, the, court, the courts have said, uh, well, we realize that today we're dealing with you know, Mr. Bank robber, Mr. Drug Dealer, but we don't mean to say that this is the way we'll deal with all the cases. Um, if we have law-abiding responsible people, we're going to use strict scrutiny. Um, and uh, uh, to my recollection, the only uh, case so far that has, in fact, used a higher level of scrutiny, of course, is the Zell case that I litigated in the Seventh Circuit, where uh, the Seventh Circuit uh, uh, instructed on remand that to the extent that Chicago would have uh, gun range regulations, Gun ranges, of course, being a traditional lawful activity for firearms. Uh, people who, using, who use them, by and large, law-abiding, uh, responsible people, I mean, like exercising their rights. That kind of regulation is going to be held to a higher than intermediate standard. Uh, the, the, the language there was, if not quite strict scrutiny, but higher than intermediate. So intermediate plus, strict minus, who knows. But in any event, the Seventh Circuit was very clear to, to distinguish its earlier case applying intermediate scrutiny to uphold the domestic violence misdemeanor ban. So we are going to see higher levels for more serious claims, lower levels for less serious claims. Rational basis is out the window. With that, I've probably spoken uh, plenty, but uh, we have lots of time for Q&A. I'd be happy to take your questions and discuss these issues. Thanks. Questions? Uh, big implication from uh, Brown versus EME. Yeah, the, uh, the Brown versus CMA case, mm -hmm. you know, how, how it uh, dealt with, you know, censorship, government control of ideas, basically. Can that be applied heavily to it? So, you know, I was reading you know, one of Don Cates' papers the other day about realistic look at gun control. So that a lot of these laws are basically symbolic. They're basically passed to say, well, we got to do something about crime. They don't care if they work. They're clearly trivial, as you point out, for assault weapons bans, you know, just basically addressing nothing out of, out of thin air. Uh, can, can that be used in that capacity? Um, so here, and also, uh, in combination with Citizens United, as to the necessity of Second Amendment being, um, it has to be able to catch up with modern society, basically. It has to be useful today and pertain to, uh, to arms designs now and in the future that are current. We don't have to be stuck with around in 1910 to 1950. That's true. Well, let's, uh, the, the I'll take the second question first. Um, the, uh, the Heller opinion says that the Second Amendment is not technologically high bound, uh, just like the other amendments are not. Uh, the First Amendment protects broadcasting, it protects the internet, it protects the Mormon religion. These are things that weren't around uh, in America in 1791. <clears throat> the Fourth Amendment has been used uh, to protect uh, your car, your telephone. Uh, things that didn't exist at the time. Uh, it protects you from a heat-seeking uh, helicopter floating over your house, the Kylo case, right? And so likewise, the Second Amendment is not technologically high-bound. Um, it really is an expectations test when it comes to the arms. It's what would be in, in common use for a traditional lawful purpose. Obviously, people today would not be using flintlocks and you know, black powder muskets to, to uh, defend themselves. Uh, the Tea Party Indians had, had pistols uh, when they were throwing the tea into, into Boston Harbor. There were handguns, but they weren't, you know, they were sort of percussive things. That we, they didn't have modern ammunition. Um, and, and, and clearly the Second Amendment is, is, is not stuck in those days any more than, you know, you can only use an 18th century printing press as opposed to a laser printer. You know, you know. So, you know, we looked at the thing's function and whether or not people's expectation of that function is served by the, by the arm. Uh, the, the first question is, you're right, I mean, a lot of uh, 
governments have grown accustomed to enacting gun laws because they feel like it. And this was the great thing about challenging the range ban in Chicago uh, because it was gratuitous. Uh, this was just something that they threw in there. There were no studies. There, were no, there was no discussion of it. We had the record from the city council. It was just something that they said, oh, well, like, might as well ban those because you know, we don't want anyone to, to you know, we don't want the, 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 the Second Amendment culture to take hold, so we're just going to ban the ranges. Well, now they have a problem because um, the Seventh Circuit has come back and said, look, it's a fundamental right. If you're going to justify this restriction, it's going to be a higher level of review, and you need empirical evidence. You, you, and, and so we sent them some discovery. Where's your empirical evidence? I don't know. We'll wait and see what the answer is. I don't think it exists. And if it does, we'll, we'll look at it. And, and, you know, and, they, and they have the burden. So yes, this is a real right. And passing feel-good legislation, it only feels good until you get the lawsuit. And, you know, and maybe then it doesn't feel so good. So some of these cities are discovering that, or they will. Um, of course, there are some gun regulations that make a lot of sense that uh, people shouldn't challenge and that will pass a review without uh, too much angst. But there are still plenty of silly ones that uh, you know, would keep me employed for a while. Can the, uh, can the direct intent of how some of these are implemented, specifically the May issue laws and the, uh, the restaurant bans, the bar bans, the college campus bans, and stuff like that, be attacked uh, via the perspective of Kassenbach versus McClung and, uh, and Brown versus Ward, and the fact that those tend to exclude people economically from, you know, from living in a certain well, place, like, uh, for example, if you live in New York or California, sure, you can get a carry license, but not if you live anywhere that you can get a job. Well, the prior restraint uh, uh, doctrine, uh, cases like uh, Lakewood, uh, uh, specifically hold that we don't take the assertion by the licensing authority that it's going to behave and only make, well, only make good decisions. You know, that, no, the issue there is the unbridled discretion itself. And the idea that the authority would promise to apply this in a fair manner is, is irrelevant. Generally speaking, though, we don't like to, I mean, when I litigate these cases, other people may do different things. You know, I, it's, it's not so much that you want to show malice on the part of the, of the government, although some government officials are very malicious. That's generally not a winning strategy. We're, we're not there to, uh, to litigate someone's state of mind uh, or their, their good nature. Um, we're there to litigate whether they're exercising lawful authority. And so their views of whether or not this is a wholesome law or a good law are irrelevant. Um, again, the content of the Second Amendment is not defined according to any kind of balancing scheme. Heller makes that very clear. Judges do not have any kind of expertise in rewriting the Constitution and telling us what should be there and what should not based upon uh, social science. And so that's not an issue. And the um, you know, the goodwill or good nature of, of the people making these decisions is, is irrelevant, although uh, it's always nice when you can look at a record in a place like Chicago or D.C. and see that there is actually a lot of bad intent on the part of the, uh, of the, of the legislative bodies there. Has there been any move to try and extend the Second Amendment beyond just state or federal, state, or local governments to actually, like, owners of apartment buildings or covenants in uh, residential subdivisions? and discharge or even ownership or ownership of firearms of residents? Well, generally speaking, the Constitution doesn't bar, doesn't, doesn't bind private parties. So you uh, have... They, you, it's banned for uh, racial discrimination and uh, religious discrimination. Not so much as a... Con it's, it's not that the landlord is violating your constitutional right. It's that we've determined that this is, you know, under the police powers of the state that discrimination is bad and uh, is bad for society and we prohibit it using you know, police powers. But when a, now, if a public housing authority bans guns, yes, those have, those have been sued. And there, are, there is litigation dealing with that. Um, they can't, you know, if the government owns it or operates it, you know, the Constitution comes into play. Uh, but if it's a purely private actor, uh, then you're, you're, in a, you're in a different situation. And it's not so much the Second Amendment that's in play, but rather the, the, the state's police power to regulate private property. Uh, and here, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there are many things that you cannot do with your own private property. 
Uh, you can't oftentimes exclude people from a public accommodation based upon uh, all these factors that are you know, forbidden for you to, to consider. Um, uh, zoning, of course, tells you what to do with your property, what not to do with your property, right? So uh, is there a role to say, look, you know, it's, uh, there is a right to bear arms for uh, self-defense. There's, uh, uh, there's a decision that's been made at the constitutional level that there's a public good here, people's ability to exercise right of self-defense. And private conduct that interferes with that public good is something that, that can be regulated. And I think that the easier cases there are the ones that, that come up dealing with, uh, with parking lots. And this is particularly an issue in the West. I mean, you know, here, or not here in Ithaca, but you know, those of you from New York City, um, you know, cars are optional, probably a bad idea. You take the subway, you walk around everywhere. Uh, at West, cities are laid out differently. You, you need to drive in Phoenix and Los Angeles. And what happens if you have a situation where all the, uh, uh, the parking lots say, well, you know, we're not going to allow people to leave guns um, uh, in their cars or have guns in their cars when they're rolling onto, onto the lot. It's our private property and that's our regulation. Well, at some point, if that impacts people's ability to uh, exercise a constitutional right, uh, perhaps there might be a rule there uh, for, uh, for regulations to kick in. Uh, not clear. It's a whole other body of law. It, it, it warrants uh, more discussion than I can give here tonight, but there is definitely a theory there that um, if you use your private property to interfere with um, something we've identified as, as being a, a public benefit and protected constitutionally, you know, the state can, can regulate that. I'm curious, you touched on um, uh, litigation strategy a little bit before. I'm curious um, about sort of strategy and picking plaintiffs um, for a two-part maybe. I know you're in Westchester, right? So mm -hmm. you're picking plaintiffs and targets. And I, I know there's a case in California, um, I think the Ninth Circuit, where there are these, there's brought a challenge. And whether you, is there, is there, are there challenges when you've got, um, or is it difficult for you when you've got other litigants sort of flying around out there making similar cases? Yeah, I could probably give you three hours on this. Because you know, sometimes I do. I mean, most times I've brought in people want to hear about the Second Amendment. Sometimes people want to hear about civil rights litigation, generally speaking, as, as, a, as, a, as an art science rather than a related to any particular issue. So what I'm going to say here applies whether you're talking about the Second Amendment, the First Amendment, abortion, gay rights, whatever. This generally applies, okay? Um, not everyone whose rights deserve to be vindicated makes a good plaintiff. Uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., uh, we had Dick Heller. Um, we could have, you know, found, you know, perhaps 20,000 other people who you know, deserve deservedly had their rights restored, but maybe they would not all have made good plaintiffs. Um, the, the problem we have now in, in public interest litigation, uh, and this is a particular problem in the Second Amendment area, although I suppose it's a scourge for people in other fields as well, um, you know, we're not in the 1950s anymore. There, there is the internet, uh, everything that uh, a lawyer writes and files in court is instantly available on PACER. Uh, people have these message boards, they get all riled up, uh, they get ideas in their heads, and in a nation of 300 million people, there's always some moron with uh, uh, money burning a hole in his pocket that, that says, oh, I'm going to go to court and file a lawsuit pro se, and, you know, uh, it's not just that I should be a great plaintiff, it's that I'm also now uh, qualified to um, engage in complex federal civil rights litigation uh, to set precedent. And that is... No, uh, lawyers can be arrogant. I've met some arrogant lawyers. I might be one of them, actually, uh, sometimes, at least. But there's nobody more arrogant and more reckless than a pro se individual who comes into court and just thinks that all of this is optional. You know that you know that uh, <laughs> going to school, learning things, uh, experience, studying civil rights litigation as a as a, as a particular field of practice. Oh, well, no, I feel really strongly my rights are violated, or RRI, you know, they go in and they get the results that one would expect them to get. Um, and uh, it's a problem, you know. Uh, we have problems with the uh, pleadings being cut and pasted and, you know, mishmashed and used for, you know, the wrong purposes and different ways. And it's, it's a problem, you know. And I'd say it's the biggest threat we've got uh, uh, in, in the Second Amendment community is 
uh, you know, I'm not so much worried about the uh, sort of the anti-gun groups and, and those people. Look, they they advocate for their position. Their arguments are wrong most of the time, if not all the time, and we can deal with that. The real problem we've got are the really horrible cases uh, that lunatics and crazy people file, uh, who think that they're you know doing the Second Amendment a favor, they're not. So, to some extent, I and other lawyers have a challenge, and that is to uh, you know we have to get good precedent on the books. We have to present courts with, with sympathetic plaintiffs, with attractive cases, with fact patterns that are more likely to elicit uh, uh, you know, good precedent. Because if you're going to make the law for law-abiding, responsible America with you know, some lunatic, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to. Have you ever talked to like, Mr. Peruta in California? Do you, do you have conversations with them and ask them to put the brakes on it? Is that ever actually happened? You know, typically speaking, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about anyone in particular, but the, <laughs> people like that are, you know, if someone if someone thinks that they got to file a lawsuit and they got to be the main party and they got to, you know, you can't really, you can't really convince. You're not going to convince them of anything. Um, you know, you can talk to them. The other thing that we won't do this this happens sometimes is somebody will file a lawsuit. Or they'll call you and say, well, "I'm going to file a lawsuit, and you better represent me because uh, you know uh, it's going to happen whether you like it or not." And I'm the guy, and I don't, I don't, I could not deal with those people. It's dumb. Sorry, I, I, I choose who I work for, and, and but you know it's a problem. Um, um, you know we have uh, we have some cases that are you know really good, some cases that are not so good, and we're not going to win all the good ones. You know I'm not. Pretending that you know every case I file is going to be a winner and it's all going to be happy. Well, I mean, you know, I'm not perfect, uh, but cases litigated by civil rights litigators who think about it a little bit and have actually gone to law school, perhaps, might turn out better than something you know done on an internet message board. Yeah, so why, I guess the other side of that is why, why Westchester? I mean, it seemed like an interesting, was it, was it the plaintiff, was it a particular <clears throat> law issue? Uh, I can't discuss all the reasons why. I mean, there are a lot of things we look at. When we, we, first of all, I mean, broadly speaking, New York had a, has a really bad law that was very ripe for targeting. It was obviously going to be done by somebody. It might as well be done by us. Um, Alan Kachalski, our lead plaintiff there, was very well positioned. He had. He's a lawyer, a pretty good one. Uh, he had um, filed a, uh, you know, an application that had been denied. We had other people that were in the same boat uh, in Westchester. There are certain things about Westchester that made it attractive to us. In any event, we're in the Second Circuit now. We filed our opening brief um, last, uh, no, this month, actually. Time goes by. Um, and uh, the government's brief will, will uh, be filed in February, February 8th, I believe. Then we get another shot. Uh, there's a cross appeal in there because we, there was a very thick motion to dismiss, um, filed for a whole host of reasons, and uh, the defense lost all those, and the county's cross appealed on one of those issues. And so, uh, you know, that's probably going to stretch the case out a little bit. But we'll see. You know, we, I feel great about that case. It's a, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't uh, win in the district court, but okay. I mean, we, we prefer winning to losing, absolutely. But what we really prefer is getting out of there. And we did that, so we're on appeal. It was obviously going to be on appeal, whether we won or lost, right? I can't imagine this. The defense wouldn't have appealed it. So um, it had it gone the, the other way. So uh, now we're, we're moving forward with that, so we'll, we'll see. But that's a great case. I'm uh, very, very uh, happy about that. And uh, we'll see what happens. Any other questions? The Second Amendment seems to be a red-headed stepchild. What led you to your interest in this area? Well, um, the uh, you know I've always believed um, strongly in the right to keep your arms and the Second Amendment. I've always wondered why it was that uh, DC could get away with having uh, the ridiculous laws that uh, that it had prior to the the Heller case. And so um, you know one day I got a phone call from Bob Levy who I knew from D.C., from being around uh, libertarian circles, I guess, and Bob told me that they were putting this case together, and 
they needed somebody to litigate it, and would I be willing to, to join in? And so I said, sure, it sounds like a great idea. You know, I didn't really think about it all that much. It was um, something I believed in, and, and I thought it would be a great case, and I, I uh, have a lot of respect for Bob and for Clark Neely, uh, and Jane Healy, who, who was on the team at the time. Uh, it seemed like a, like a real solid case and, and uh, you know we, we didn't know that we were going to win but we thought we had a good chance of it and we thought it made sense to, to, to file the case so we went with it and that led to other things because of course it's opened up this this field of litigation which uh, you know keeps me off the streets I guess but uh, you know the, the Second Amendment is actually a real part of the Bill of Rights uh, it, it, it actually does have operative effect in the United States. It's not. I know some people think it's crazy uh, and uh, think it's a really bad idea, but uh, you, know, you can say that about any any uh, part of the Bill of Rights. I'm not sure that we could ratify the Bill of Rights today. Any of it. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think the Fourth Amendment would be ratified today uh, with the, sort of the, the, all the drug warriors and, and other uh, such uh, you know law enforcement mentality that we have in the country. I don't think that. The Eighth Amendment would fly today. I don't think the First Amendment would fly today in its current form. Um, but again, the founders were, 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 were truly brilliant people. And they left us a document that they understood would uh, be in conflict with the popular will from time to time. That's the whole point of the Constitution. The point of having a Constitution that guarantees individual rights is that you take certain principles and you enshrine them and you elevate them and immunize them from the political process. If, if we could always trust these rights to be respected, we, we wouldn't need the Bill of Rights. But we do. And, and the fact that we have, from time to time, laws needing of uh, uh, revision by the courts uh, is, is a testament to that fact that uh, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have this good mechanism in place in the Bill of Rights. Any other questions? I know you wanted to ask me more stuff. Uh, any, uh, any chance we can get the Palmer versus DC case moving for a change? Why do you know about all these cases? Why? That's great. <laughs> Palmer v. DC. The one yeah. spells horribly again. Well, you know, again, uh, one of the weaknesses in our system is that there's really nothing lawyers can do to make the court decide a case. You know, we file the case, we argue it, we meet our deadlines, we do what we're supposed to do, you know, we eat our vegetables and all that, but, you know, there's nothing, I can't make a court decide a case. Um, so Palmer, you're right, uh, that case, this is a challenge to DC's complete ban on the carrying of handguns outside the home. Uh, it was filed a very long time ago, it was argued a very long time ago. This summer, the, uh, uh, the judge was replaced. Uh, the judge was, that judge was replaced in a number of cases. The court was just apparently overloaded and a new judge was brought in from not too far away actually, a senior, a senior district judge from the Northern District of New York uh, was brought in to relieve some of the workload in Washington, D.C. This was one of the cases that landed on his desk. Uh, he met with us right away and said, you know, said he would decide it, so that's where we are. You know, and uh, I suppose that one of these days we'll get a decision and hopefully we'll win, and either way I'm sure it'll go up. So uh, all we can do is be patient. So pretty much count on Peterson versus Kyle Garcia or whoever they're on to. You know, it's really, you never know which funny bounces happen, cases pop up, things move suddenly and slow down. Litigation is not a predictable, uh, it's not all that predictable, and, and, and you're right. I mean, if you had told me um, years ago that certain cases would still be pending, uh, you know, I would have said, wow, that, that, that'd be unfortunate, but it wouldn't be predictable. So we'll see. That's all we can do is just Litigate the cases, hope the judge decide. I think both plans and desires they not use them and control or anything like that. Nope. Uh, that's you know, that's that's not you know the 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 Solicitor General in, the, in Heller filed a very unhelpful brief, um, which has now actually in a way become the model for the for the bad decisions, you know. If you if you want to see how Courts make mistakes in the Second Amendment. Look to Paul Clement's brief in, in, in Heller, where he proposed 
this very interesting idea that we're going to use intermediate scrutiny, but it's such a weak form of intermediate scrutiny that even Washington, D.C.'s laws, a complete ban on functional firearms in the home, might be constitutional and you need a trial and a remand in any event to sort out. I mean, so that's, you know, Courts have latched on to that idea where you, where you see courts making mistakes, they'll say, oh, intermediate scrutiny, and then they'll make it rational basis like and stuff. So, but one of the things that, that, that Paul did in that case is, you know, the word machine gun appeared in that brief 10 times. That was not there to help us. Uh, and I faced a lot of very um, uh, skeptical questioning about, you know, do you want machine guns? This is about machine guns. And, you know, look, the court's not going to find you have a right to a machine gun under the Second Amendment. Uh, I think you can make the argument either way. Um, I, can, you know, I don't think it's a winning argument. I've heard versions of the argument for it. I don't think that they're going to persuade anybody. And so why waste time making bad law that, you know, we don't need more examples of things that, that aren't covered by the Second Amendment. We need some examples of things that are. And I have clients who have real problems getting basic handguns, basic rifles. And yes, I get plenty of uh, flack from the machine gun aficionados who uh, always complain about, you know, that, uh, you know, I threw them under the proverbial bus and all this stuff. But look, you know, uh, it's, it's not a, a credible claim in the courts. Thank you so much.